G'day and welcome to what is apparently a ridiculous vehicle that everyone seems to despise. It's the Ram 1500. Now, before all you Ram fans start freaking out, I'll explain what I mean in a second. But first of all, let's set the scene here. Even though Ram trucks have been making these things since the early 1980s, in this particular video, we're gonna be focusing on the fourth generation DS and specifically in 1500 form. Stateside, these 1500s first appeared back in 2009 and after nearly yearly updates are still a current model. However, here in Australia, the majority of DS 1500s will span from around about 2017 to 2021. Loads of the 1500s here on Aussie shores have arrived via grey importers, but Ram Trucks Australia is the only company that have imported and distributed the official export spec left-hand drive new vehicles directly from the Ram factory in the US, and then, using hundreds of locally sourced parts, converts them to right-hand drive. Now look, obviously in this video we're going to be going over loads of information about the Ram 1500, but if you require the really, really specific information, make sure you jump on redriven.com and check out our incredibly handy and totally free redriven cheat sheets. Basically, it's like the ultimate used car buyer's guide for the 1500. Now, back to that, let's say, slightly offensive introduction, the reality is... A load of people hate these things. They despise what these big American pickup trucks even stand for. But in saying that, the other reality is very few other vehicles can do what these can do. Like their towing capacity is incredible. Their practicality is amazing. They've got really good off-roading chops. Not to mention the whole, you might hate it or love it, but the whole X factor, you've got to admit, it has got like an image to it. And look, yes, there are other vehicles that are better or you know more capable at individual things than this, but to encapsulate it all, it, kind of, it has to be one of these. However, for those that just don't understand or just don't get the whole big American pickup truck thing, these are just wrong. Firstly, they take up an enormous amount of real estate on the road. Secondly, American cars here in Australia have a horrible reputation when it comes to reliability. And thirdly, if ever a car was to scream, I hate the environment and I want to destroy it instantly, it's one of these. But look, if you can wrap your head around the entire image that these things portray, like what actually goes wrong with them? What do they like to live with on a daily basis? What do they like to drive? Most importantly, but should you buy one? Okay, so first impressions, look, this is a bloody big thing and my God, it feels it. Now look, I know those of you watching in North America are gonna go, that's not a big pickup truck. We've got the 25 and the 3500, but look here in Australia, and even when compared to our 4x4 dual cab utes, this thing, it just, it feels like driving a block of apartments. However, in its defense, its sheer size and how big it feels isn't that much of a problem out on like country roads or out on the freeway. And in those situations, it feels bloody lovely to drive. Look, there's no hiding its size, and especially when country roads get a little bit narrower, but it just, it just simply lopes along. Now, this particular 1500 isn't exactly standard. It's on aftermarket suspension, aftermarket wheels, all-terrain tires, and it has an exhaust system, but it is packing the Hemi V8 and what? What a wonderful power plant this thing is. Like, first of all, the sound, Oh, that is addictive. But even just the way the power comes on, it's so linear, it's so torquey, meaty. Love it, love this thing. But as good as the engine is, there is a problem with it, and it's this. When you do this, with current petrol prices, that just costs $45. Also in terms of sounds, look, forget all of those old dodgy right-hand drive conversions that feel like you're driving a cutlery drawer in an earthquake. This thing, no rattles, no squeaks, it feels super tight. You've got to hit some pretty massive bumps to hear anything rattling, and at the moment, the only thing rattling is the camera mount. Now, this suspension package is fantastic. It honestly leaves the majority of dual cab utes for dead in terms of ride comfort and compliance. Even when you're hitting some really big bumps, like we've hit some pretty massive pop I'll see you like this one, nothing, nothing. It's nearly Raptor Ranger good. And out here, because like you're just so comfortable in here and the controls are all quite light, it's genuinely relaxing. However, once you get into suburban or metropolitan areas, all of that is out the door. It all completely changes. First of all, trying to find a car park in any kind of Australian metropolitan or built up area is basically near impossible. I was driving this thing earlier in a little suburb called Curry Curry, and it felt like it took three hours to find a car park because here in Australia, car parks just are not designed for something this size. The other issue with car parks is the fact that 
Because the bonnet kind of slopes away, it's really hard to judge the parameters of the front of the vehicle, and there's no parking sensors up front. So you're kind of going, God, what am I gonna hit? Like, it's really hard to judge. Even at the back, yes, it has parking sensors, and yes, it has a reversing camera, but that's good for stuff from directly from behind. If you've got something over your rear three-quarter angle, again, can be bloody hard to judge where it is. Look, there's no denying that the driving experience with this, it is, it is full of charm and character, and out on these country roads and on a freeway or towing, it absolutely excels. But when it comes to like suburban and metropolitan areas, as far as day-to-day -day living and driving, it is full of compromises. Now, in terms of the interior, the first thing that hits you is just the sheer amount of space in here. It is bloody huge. It feels like the passenger is like an entire different suburb away, but also these seats are so comfortable. They feel like lounge chairs. I should also mention this car has been trimmed in a, uh, let's say aftermarket leather pack. But in saying that, the leather pack is about the only cushy feeling thing because everything else in here is just hard plastics. Even the steering wheel, it's not leather lined. It's like a vinyl kind of steering wheel. I feel that kind of does suit the, the image and the purpose of this truck. You know, it is, it, is a, it is a work vehicle for this owner. So yeah, that kind of makes sense. I get it. Even design wise, it's a very American design in here. It's certainly not hiding its heritage whatsoever and neither it should. This is proudly American which many aren't. Also, re remember this has been converted to right-hand drive by Ram Trucks Australia, and they have done an exceptional job, except one point, which we'll get to in a second. I've driven a, a bunch of like right-hand converted cars. Most of them feel like an, a, a complete joke. This feels really legit, except for the fact that the handbrake, which is actually a foot brake, is on the right-hand side. For me, that just feels wrong. It should be over the left-hand side, like a Mercedes or some early Nissans. But yeah, on the right-hand side, plus, to push it down, you've got to lift your leg up quite high. I'm luckily relatively flexible. If you're not that flexible, this position could be a challenge. Now, in terms of wear and tear, again, this guy drives this thing every day. It's generally towing cars and all sorts of crazy stuff. It is used hard. And wear and tear-wise, excellent. Probably because everything is made of very hard plastics. There basically is no signs of wear and tear even after a load of kilometers on it. Seats feel great, the plastics feel great, all the buttons, everything feels good, tough. And in terms of practicality up front, first of all, you've got like a mantelpiece or bookshelf here. Got a pretty decent sized glove box there. You've got kind of hidden storage under here, which yeah, kind of holds your phone, sort of. Spot up here, which again, kind of, sort of, doesn't really hold your phone just there. You've got a little bin here for like nail clippings and bits of dried flesh. Okay size door bins with a spot for a bottle. Also a spot for business cards just here. Three cup holders here with like little squidgy, I don't know, little squidgy toe things that hold your cup nicely. And finally, a spot for all of your lifely belongings under there. That can also become a seat, but not here because there's no seat belt for it. But some models, that can be a third seat up front. Now in the back seat, I'm exactly 10 centimeters taller than the most devastatingly talented and efficient American ever, Mr. Chuck Norris. This is in my driving position. And it's interesting, if you're gonna be lugging people back here all of the time, you're gonna want the crew cab because this being a quad cab, it's pretty squishy back here. First of all, the seats are almost like 90 degrees from the actual, you know, the base section. So I feel like I'm sitting up way too tall. There's like, as you can see, hardly any knee room. I've got to do a, a leg spread. And it just feels claustrophobic in general. I know that larger versions of these in the back, it's almost like another lounge chair. And they do offer a whole lot more backseat room than, you know, most of the other dual cab utes on the Australian market. But this one certainly doesn't. As far as wear and tear back here, like basically none. I don't think this guy ever has anyone back here, understandably, because I can't feel my feet anymore. As far as practicality in the back seat, first up, grab handles to get into. That is fantastic. Some utes don't have that and they definitely should. Behind this weird kind of quilted leather thing, you've got some matte pockets back here, two cup holders down here, a decent amount of foot room down there so you can put like a backpack and whatever, but that's about it. Although, the rear seat bases fold up, giving even more storage space. Now, practicality in the back is interesting because, look, yeah, look, the tub is larger, but it's not like heaps larger than other dual cab utes in the market. Plus, even its payload is pretty much on par with other dual cab utes at 845 kilos. However, when it comes to towing, this thing excels. Its rated towing capacity is four and a half tons, which is a thousand kilos more than the vast majority of other dual cab utes on the market. Also, loads of Ram 1500s feature these Ram boxes. These things are ingenious. Pop that open and you can store all sorts of stuff in there. Plus they're waterproof. You can actually fill this with ice and, you know, a nice Pinot Grigio. And then once the ice melts, you can drain it all out because there's a little rubber bung down there. Excellent. 
Now in terms of tech and features, look, it's going to vary immensely depending on the year, the trim spec, and also the accessories fitted aftermarket because plenty of these have been modified in one way or another. But the absolute minimum that you can expect will include 20 inch alloy wheels, although many used examples like this one have aftermarket wheels and tyres fitted, front fog lamps, rear parking sensors, side steps, and a heavy duty tow bar. Well, inside, even on lower spec models, you're going to get a pretty decent sounding six speaker sound system with Bluetooth connectivity playing via Uconnect via this very cute little five inch touchscreen. How pretty and cute is that? You're also going to get cruise control, climate control and central locking. However, get yourself into a more recent and high spec example and you can expect everything from a rear view camera, parking sensors, which are honestly in this thing a must, leather upholstery, a large 8.4 Uconnect display with Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, an excellent sounding 10 speaker sound system, Additional 12 volt power outlets at the rear, heated and ventilated front seats, heated rear seats, opening rear window, and climate control air conditioning. Actually, while we're talking about trim specs, in North America, these are available in over a dozen different trim levels. Like seriously, how do you guys decide what to buy? Because here in Australia, we generally have two, which is the Express and the Laramie, and there's a light dusting of other special editions as well. Also, depending on the year and the variant, these trim specs are available in either quad cab or the longer rear door and more back seat space, yet a shorter tub sized crew cab. Now, in terms of safety, look, even though Australian Safety Authority ANCAP haven't tested one of these, let's be honest here, with the size and weight of this thing, really, it's just going to smash through whatever it hits in the first place. But look, to give you an overview of what safety features that you can expect, here's me doing another voiceover, but this time I'm going to do it in, like, classic Ram 1500 kind of style. The safety features you can expect include the finest six airbags, ABS, EBD and ESC, a hill holder, trailer sway control, traction control and rear parking assist. You can forget about like any you know, modern active safety features at all, but for all of the specific details of the safety features, the equipment, the tech, all that sort of stuff, just jump on redriven.com and check out that cheat sheet. Okay, so what goes wrong with these? Well, kicking off with the exterior, there are quite a few reports that the rear windows can leak in really heavy rain and in like, you know, high pressure, you know, car washers and things like that. The good news is, it's generally just the seals being fitted incorrectly and that's a pretty easy and inexpensive fix. Next up, these locking mechanisms on the rear tray can be faulty. Sometimes they just get locked and sometimes they just fall open. In some really early models, there are reports of just corrosion and decay around the rear wheel arches. Also, on some models that have chrome bumpers, it is known that the chrome can kind of rust and corrode pretty easily. Some owners have complained that they'd be better off using their phone screens to light the road ahead rather than the headlights because apparently the headlights are a bit underdone in some models. Okay, problems inside. The Uconnect navigation systems are known to play up pretty frequently. The Bluetooth connectivity and even the reversing cameras can glitch out. But the good news is that's generally fixed up with just a you know, little software update. Also, there are quite a few reports that the cruise control can have some problems, either just not activating or just turning off randomly, stuff like that. In saying that, but it's a pretty rare occurrence, they're sporadic reports. Now guys, if you haven't already hit those like, subscribe and bell buttons, can you please do so? Because honestly, it helps us out so, so much. Okay, now mechanically, what goes wrong with the Ram 1500? I'd bloody love to tell you, but I really shouldn't because I'm not a qualified mechanic, but Jim certainly is. In Australia, 96% of the Ram 1500s are powered by the petrol 5.7 litre V8 Hemi. They are four-wheel drive and they run through an eight-speed transmission. The remaining few are all powered by the VM Matori V6 diesel. Now it's an okay engine and it's in a lot of different Chrysler's, Jeeps and even Maseratis, but considering they're in so few of these in Australia, for this video, we're just gonna stick to the V8 Hemi. And that V8 Hemi is widely considered as very reliable and also used in a bunch of different makes and models. And in some applications, supercharged making immense and very reliable horsepower. There are though, but mainly in the earlier models, widespread reports of camshaft and lifter problems. Now that can be attributed to a design flaw relating to the angle of the lifters and oil supply complications. You'll know you've got a camshaft or a lifter problem because it's a ticking sound you can hear. Uh, it's worse when the car is cold as well. But sometimes that ticking sound can be present for basically the whole of the engine's life and never manifest into a problem. But other times it does worsen and it can lead to camshaft and lifter failure. And in other cases, the ticking sound is not the lifters at all. It's something completely different, which I'll get to next. Your best bet to mitigate camshaft and lifter issues is just change the oil and filter regularly every 10,000 Ks religiously. Now do it more so if you're towing and more so too if the vehicle is sitting around idling for long or abnormal periods of time. Now fun fact, that's why a lot of the cop cars with these engines in them have problems because they do sit around idling. Now that ticking sound I mentioned, just be careful it's not misdiagnosed. 
because another common and thankfully much cheaper to fix problem they have is they break exhaust manifold studs and sometimes the manifold warps too. And a ticking sound is just an exhaust leak. And it too is much worse when it's cold. The Chrysler Torque Flight 8 automatic transmission, it's actually a version of the 8 HP 70 ZF transmission, which is in a load of different vehicles, cars and trucks. They are considered widely reliable with no one serious common problem that causes catastrophic failures. In the Ram trucks, the early ones especially, they did have a few safety recalls with the transmission so if you're looking at one, make sure all of the recalls are up to date. The transmission service intervals are every 100,000 Ks, but if you're towing and you want it to last, just do that every 50,000 Ks. Other than that with these things, it's just random electrical, mechanical and drivetrain issues or complications that you would see on a lot of other vehicles. But unfortunately with these, and some say it's build quality and other people say it's what they're being used for, those problems do tend to occur just slightly more frequently. Basically what I'm saying is sometimes they're a little bit shit and other times they're totally not. Now pricing here in Australia, it currently kicks off from around about 80,000 bucks and tops out at around about $160,000. And now look, I know that might seem expensive, but in reality, like a dual cab ute converted 200 series or 70 series Land Cruiser, some of those are asking as much as $260,000. So compared to the Toyotas, this is a bit of a bargain. And not only that, this is how it comes out of the box. You don't have to faff around with conversions and modifications. This is pretty much standard. It's not standard, actually. It's got aftermarket suspension, different wheels, and an exhaust system, but you know what I mean. Now, Ram claims a fuel consumption figure of 12.2 litres per 100 k's for the V8s and 11.9 litres per 100 for the diesels. However, in the real world and through our research, we found that many Ram owners are claiming that they get 13 to 14 litres per 100 for the V8s and 12 to 13 for the diesels. And like obviously, you know, towing, doing heavy off-roading or bolting a couple of tons worth of accessories to it, that'll all impact that fuel consumption as well. Okay, but after all of that, should you buy one? Look, I'm going to be honest here, before we started researching these, I honestly just didn't get the Ram 1500. I just assumed they were purely for towing really, really heavy things or just, you know, making up for their owner's lack of self-esteem. But my God, I was wrong. Very few other vehicles have such a breadth of talents like the Ram 1500. And when compared to the dual cab utes that we are generally more familiar with here in Australia, the big American is simply more comfortable, more practical, is significantly better for towing, and is even arguably more enjoyable to drive. And that Hemi V8, it, it adds so much soul and character to this thing. But look, don't get us wrong because they're far from perfect. Parking in any metro area is a complete nightmare. It's pretty bloody expensive to own and people will make assumptions about the sort of person that you are. However, if you genuinely require this vehicle's amazing set of skills and you're also completely aware of what you're signing yourself up to and you've found like the perfect example that ticks all of the boxes, it's a yes from us. It's a cautious yes, but it's a yes. Also, here's a question for you. Would you actually buy one of these or would you buy one of the, um, let's say, lesser 4x4 dual cab utes that just wish they could do what this thing can do? See you next time. Also, loads of Ram 1500s in Australia feature these Ram boxes. These things are awesome. Uh -huh. Plus, you can even fill them with ice, which becomes water, but there's a little bung down there, so you can pull that out and... Uh, uh, slow down. Well, inside, even on base models, you're going to have... F me. Figure for the V8s, but... Sorry. Now, Ram, oh, f me, Morris, come on. Lesser four x four dual cab utes that just wish they could do what this thing could. F so close. Here we go.